certainly my friendship with Benazir Bhutto at Oxford, and um, I know there are others in this audience who were profoundly affected by meeting her. And so I think, so it continues, that may we work on everything that we have learnt through these wonderful relationships. It's now with great pleasure I'm going to ask Professor Ian Talbot, a distinguished academic and historian of Pakistan. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts. Um, I'll start off again with uh, my personal background, which has been a, th a thread running through uh, the panel. Um, I was a young research student uh, in Pakistan at the time of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's trial before the Lahore High Court. Uh, and throughout that period of time, uh, I obviously followed at a distance a drama which uh, no one at that time thought would eventually lead uh, to the uh, judicial execution uh, which followed and which, of course, uh, we are commemorating uh, today. Most of the rest of my academic career has been trying to uh, understand Pakistan and to uh, reflect on its history. I'm a historian by training uh, and indeed uh, also uh, to try and remove some of the misconceptions uh, that there are uh, about Pakistan uh, in the West and also some of the misconceptions which there are around leading figures uh, in Pakistan's history. And we've already heard today uh, that uh, Zofikar Ali Bhutto uh, is a figure of some controversy uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, as well as even his detractors would say uh, one of the most important and significant figures uh, in the history of Pakistan. And what I've tried to do in my uh, various uh, works over the years is to provide a balanced account of, of the factors which help us to understand how Pakistan got to where it was at the time uh, of um, certainly um, the emergence of the PPP uh, and uh, to see what happened in the subsequent uh, history uh, of the state. And I think it's very important um, perhaps to start off uh, by perhaps comparing uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto uh, with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah, a figure in Pakistan's history who of course uh, is not controversial in the way that Zulfikar Ali Bhutto is, uh, but who in many senses did the same was faced with the same situation uh, that Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was, making a new state. Uh, because, of course, really, when uh, Bhutto became president and then later prime minister, this was a new state. Uh, a sixth of the territory of the old Pakistan state had been lost. Uh, we heard a little bit about Dundee and the jute industry. Jute had been the main uh, export earner of the Pakistan state. Uh, so the Pakistan that Zofikar Ali Bhutto came to rule was a Pakistan facing the similar kinds of problems uh, that the early Jinnah uh, faced. Uh, not necessarily large-scale migration and refugee problems, which is what Pakistan faced at the beginning, but certainly creating a new state in adverse circumstances. And I think that uh, Bhutto's career needs to be understood fully within that context of the problems uh, really that Pakistan faced after um, the breakup of the country uh, and the war with India, which of course left 93,000 prisoners of war uh, of the Pakistan army. Uh, and what Bhutto did uh, in dealing with this situation was to give a new vision, just as Jinnah had given an original vision for Pakistan uh, so Zulfikar Ali Bhutto gave a new vision and a new confidence for a Pakistan state which was really facing what one might call a sort of existential crisis, a crisis of identity, but also a crisis of social welfare. Uh, and that is something which I do want to speak a little bit about. We've heard a lot of discussion so far about foreign policy. And indeed, in many ways, this is quite appropriate uh, because Zulfikar Ali Bhutto excelled in terms of Pakistan's foreign policy. Uh, and the similar accord which we saw 
uh, on the screen, also uh, the Islamic summit. These were very important developments for a state uh, which had faced the crisis uh, of the civil war and then the, the military conflict with India and the breakup of the country. Uh, now, why is it that um, Bhutto is a, more of a controversial figure than Jinnah? Uh, both of them trying to create a new state. Well, the point is, of course, that many of the issues and problems uh, which Bhutto had to tackle uh, are still there in Pakistan today. What is its identity? Is it a plural state? Or is it a state created around Islam? Is, is Pakistan to be uh, a state which is uh, there for the well-being, really, of a small elite? Or is it a state which is there to meet the aspirations of the young, particularly? Uh, Lots of writers talk about the youth bulge in uh, Pakistan today, but not just of the young, but of the poor. What kind of vision is there for the future? And this is a contested vision, because of course there were opponents within Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's uh, lifetime, and certainly after he was uh, executed, who had a very different vision of Pakistan. And we've heard a little bit about Zia al-Haq and his vision of Pakistan. And indeed, these two visions of Pakistan uh, are still in contest today. What kind of Pakistan should there be? So inevitably, until there is a resolution, I would argue in favor of a more progressive and plural Pakistan, um, Bhutto's legacy is going to be highly contested because those people who opposed him during his lifetime still oppose the vision of Pakistan uh, today. So that's one reason why Bhutto obviously is a more controversial figure uh, than Jinnah, although in many ways is a greater figure in terms of his legacies uh, for, for Pakistan. We haven't talked about his legacies outside of foreign policy, though some of these were shown on the screen. The 1973 Constitution, probably the greatest legacy in many ways uh, of, of the Bhutto period. Uh, we haven't talked other than in terms of the slogans uh, of uh, the 1970 election campaign uh, of his legacy. And what you've got to remember is that um, the great transformation uh, that he brought to Pakistan politics uh, in terms of actually being concerned and bothered about the well-being of ordinary people. This had not been an aspect of Pakistan politics, either in what I would call the failed liberal democracy uh, of the 1950s, and certainly not of the Ayub Khan military uh, era which followed. We all know in this audience the 22 families who prospered uh, during that period. Uh, and indeed, you could almost argue that the breakup of Pakistan was in part the result of the social inequalities between East and West Pakistan in terms of its economic development, and also within West Pakistan itself, which were causing real tensions. And this is the context, of course, in which the PPP was born, a party, a new party, dedicated to the ordinary people to try and break down these inequalities uh, and to try and create opportunities for those groups within Pakistan uh, who felt not only politically marginalized, but also marginalized in terms of their econ economic well-being. And of course, many of these problems still persist uh, in Pakistan today. People don't have access to clean water. They don't have equal access to education. There are inequalities between rural and urban communities. There are inequalities between provinces uh, and within provinces. And until these inequalities are actually addressed, Pakistan will not, I think, gain the political stability and strong consolidated democracy which certainly was the aim of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and should be the aim for all well-wishers of the country. Until it achieves that, it's always going to be vulnerable to uh, exploitive rulers. It's always going to be vulnerable to the possibility of, of some kind of guided democracy, whether it's directly military intervention, as in the Zia era, or whether it's the military uh, pulling the strings uh, behind the scenes, which seems to be the preferred option uh, in Pakistan today because it, it, it's, it's more convenient then to blame the politicians for things which do go wrong whilst really calling all the shots in the areas which the military 
are interested, whether that's their industrial interest or whether it's their security interest uh, or foreign policy interest vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan uh, or India. So these are all the issues which Zofikar Ali Bhutto tried to resolve uh, and uh, was prevented from doing, but there are continuing uh, problems within Pakistan which, as I say, help to explain uh, why, he, why his legacy is so contested, because there are groups who have benefited. Um, Zir al-Haq was a ruthless dictator, yes, but some groups in Pakistan benefited from the Zir period. He wasn't unloved and unmourned when he died. That's the reality. Uh, there are groups within Pakistan who did very well under Zir. These are the groups who are still uh, contesting, perhaps, the vision uh, for Pakistan, uh, which Zulfikar Ali Bhutto had. So it's an unresolved uh, conflict. And it's because of that unresolved conflict that his legacy is as it is, and the controversies are still there regarding uh, his reputation uh, in, in some quarters. And I will say here as a historian that um, there still isn't a decent biography of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. There's the Stanley Wolpert book, which I'm sure many of you may have read, um, uh, Zulfi Bhutto of Pakistan, but I think any sort of academic analysis of that uh, book would, would show that it really, in many senses, is a missed opportunity in terms of truly understanding uh, what drove Bhutto uh, and the kind of resistances uh, that he encountered uh, in, in his career. So there, there is not uh, an uncontested legacy as there is uh, with Jinnah. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say, of course, that the Bhutto's uh, importance for Pakistan is, is not of a similar quality uh, as that uh, of Jinnah's uh, legacy. I just want to finish really on one point, and that is the point of uh, populism, progressive politics, sometimes uh, the phrase Islamic socialism. Uh, if we're looking outside of Pakistan, uh, and don't forget within Pakistan, um, past politics and present politics are closely intertwined. Uh, history is contested. If we're looking outside of Pakistan, what is it outside of Pakistan which has impacted on Bhutto's uh, image. And for many writers, of course, uh, it is the rise uh, of a sort of uh, a neoliberal uh, approach to economics. What you've got to remember is that what Bhutto did during his time in office, uh, nationalization of industries, workers' rights, um, land reform, these were things which went directly against what became the orthodoxy, really, by the, the 1980s uh, of economic policy. Uh, austerity rather than growth uh, became the name of the game. And, of course, Pakistan itself had this imposed on it, often through conditionalities attached to IMF uh, sort of funding. So Bhutto's uh, economic policy uh, is, is really also come in for Criticism, again, I don't know if it's a book which you've read, but J.S. Berkey's book, Pakistan under Bhutto, 1971 to 77. This reflects an early and still influential account along these lines of neoliberal uh, critiques uh, of uh, Bhutto's progressive populist politics. Uh, and of course, these neoliberal accounts always reflect on the so-called massive amount of political corruption encouraged by nationalization. There was very little evidence of nationalization actually leading to this, but that's become part of the stock uh, critique. Uh, uh, I think the Zia regime, which tried in very other ways to undermine Bhutto's character and legacy, if they could have really found a lot of evidence of corruption uh, through nationalization, they would have really come strong on that. There was an evidence. Of that. So the debates then concerning the economic impact of the Bhutto government are also part, as well as this contestation of what kind of Pakistan it should be in the future, which helps to explain why uh, Zulfi Ali Bhutto is um, a contested figure uh, in the history uh, of the country. 
How do we sum all this up? Or how would I, anyway, as a historian, sum all this up? I think, to put it simply, uh, Butto's charisma, and that came across very strongly uh, in the um, film that we saw, was rooted, really, primarily in his embodiment of popular aspirations for social justice. A social justice which had been denied by successive governments. He projected himself as a man of the people, in contrast with what might be termed the drawing room politicians, uh, and maintained uh, that, quote, his voice was the people's voice, his speeches, their speeches. I would argue Pakistan still awaits a leader who can satisfy the common people's authentic demands for both democratic inclusion and social justice. Uh, 36 years after his death, Zofikar Ali Bhutto's name remains a stirring popular memory uh, for the task of the transformation of Pakistan, which goes way beyond just establishing functioning democracy. If it's going to be a stable and progressive state, much more than that needs to be done. But Bhutto's legacy and his legendary status really is someone who, for the first time, brought the people and the common people into uh, the political mainstream. Uh, I think uh, it is as relevant, in fact, it's more relevant now than it was uh, at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Ian Torbert. I think it's terribly important that we do learn our history. And um, certainly, I know one of the difficulties, particularly during the Zia regime, was how hard it was to find anything about Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. He was being written out of the history books. And I happen to remember that newspapers used to appear with blank columns um, if there was anything going to be written about the Bhutto family, because this was a very crude.